All right, so welcome everybody to the Trusted CI Virtual Institute. Sorry, I've got or, <laughs> yeah, whatever it is. Um, too many calls. And today we have Tim Hudson from Neon. Uh, he's a security analyst three in Boulder, Colorado. Um, before Neon, he worked for IBM's professional security service services team. He's a certified certified ethical hacker, a certified information systems security professional, and many more things that hopefully we'll hear about. And uh, oh, he likes to play golf, and he has a, a Jeep to enjoy the mountains with. So welcome, Tim, and uh, really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, thank you. Um, that was a great intro, by the way. Um, oh, and one so, more question. So the the fellow, so do you want questions just as they come in? Do you want me to interrupt with questions, or the fellows to interrupt with questions, or would you prefer to save them till the end? Yeah, that would be good. Um, just uh, anytime. anytime, anytime works for me. Great. So, so being a security guy, where I'm not used to speaking. So, uh, <laughs> although I anybody that knows me will tell you that I'm very uh, chatty. So. Uh, so hopefully uh, this will go well. Um, haven't done a presentation in quite a while. Um, welcome everybody. Um, I'm glad to be here, honored to be here. The, uh, I thought this was the first one, but I got told it wasn't. So I got disappointed because I thought I'd get to set the bar. But uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit today about NEON and the NEON project uh, up here in Boulder. It's a uh, NSF project, major facility. And I'll talk a little bit about that and then uh, cybersecurity and how the two relate. Um, let me uh, let me share my slides here if I can find them. Dun, 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 right there. Dun, dun, dun. Can everybody see that all right? Yep, looks great. Okay, now I gotta close all these windows with people. Uh, so basically, um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I've been in uh, technology for over 20 years. Um, started at the bottom, pretty much. Um, start, and I guess the bottom would be uh, uh, field support, desktop support, help desk, uh, worked my way up to server engineering. Um, didn't take very long for that. And then uh, it just goes on and on and on up to uh, into the security realm. Um, I had a manager at IBM told me, um, go where the cheese is. And uh, of course, uh, cybersecurity got hot a couple of years ago and uh, I was already there, so it worked out well for me. Um, I worked on that IBM team and at the time we were the top ranked team in the world. I worked on that team for about three years, the top ranked team that is. Um, and on that team, we, were, uh, we worked on multiple high visibility breaches. Um, I won't go into who they were um, for confidentiality reasons, but uh, we worked all over the world. Um, it was the consultant job uh, on a plane every week, um, flying all over, uh, very, very tiresome. Um, and then I have multiple certifications. Um, the one that, uh, that she just mentioned was the certified ethical hacker. And that leads into the, the next slide here. Um, so when you, that's the, that's the cert that I have that gets the most attention. Um, everybody sees the word hacker and they get all excited about it. And um, this, I thought this slide was perfect for what, you know, what my mom thinks I do, what society thinks I do, what my friends think I do, what my boss, of course, I think I'm a firefighter, but actually you spend most of the day uh, looking at logs, um, logging into systems. Um, it's not near as exciting as everybody thinks it is. Uh, so the NEON project, um, we're based out of uh, Boulder, Colorado. Uh, this is the, uh, actually straight off of the website, the, it's a uh, National Ecological Observatory Network. It's uh, across the entire continent. Uh, the goal is to uh, collect long-term open access ecological data to better understand how the U.S. ecosystems are changing. Um, basically, we've got, um, I'll skip down here, the, we collect data from 81 terrestrial towers, which I'll show you here in a minute, and uh, we also, and freshwater aquatic field sites, 
in the United States. Um, so the United States is, uh, here's one of the towers, and this is in Alaska. And basically what you're looking at, uh, we build this tower and then those booms coming off the sides, uh, like you'll see the thing that looks like an upside down plate with a tube coming off of it. That's actually a temperature sensor. Um, and this was really interesting to me because I asked the, the science guys, I was like, how does, how does that work? How do you get a temperature without anything affecting it, like the sun or, or whatever? So inside that tube on the bottom there is the, um, there's a sensor inside there and there's a little fan at the bottom and it pulls air because you don't want the fan to cool it off, right? So it pulls air in there very gently, I guess you would say. And then of course the, the plate and everything shades it. So, um, so those are temperature sensors. And then you'll see also on the end there, there's, there's wind cups to do wind speed, uh, barometric pressure. Uh, we're, and then we also have an air operations wing that uh, flies over and looks at land use. And uh, we're basically, so here's a map of how NEON set up. Uh, the United States has been broken into 20 different ecosystems. And then you'll see the little blue dots are the aquatic sites. Um, some of the aquatic sites are buoys floating in rivers, lakes. Um, and then there's the terrestrial sites, which are the towers that I was just showing you. And uh, so this is basically all of our infrastructure all over the United States, including Alaska and Puerto Rico and Hawaii. And then as you can imagine, we've, we've got to be able to get the data from these sites back to Boulder or back to Denver where our data center's at. And it gets entertaining. Um, I've, you know, I've told our network guys, they've got the best network job in the world. Um, they're not sitting in a closet working on a router. You know, they're, they're trying to figure out how to bounce a microwave over a mountain in Alaska to try to get, you know, an internet connection to a site, you know, a hundred miles from any town in the middle of the of Alaska in the snow. So, so basically that's what we do. We collect all this data. The idea is um, then we, we disperse this data. Um, we uh, it's, uh, if you go to the neonscience.org, there's a data portal and uh, it's available to everybody. And basically this is uh, data science. Um, all the different things that everybody's uh, studying statistical modeling and um, research and all the different uh, things you would expect from science. So that's basically, uh, that's basically the, what NEON does. Um, we technically are open science. Um, and the reason I bring this up is we're going to get into it a little bit later, but Open science, I, I mean, this, this defines it. I like this definition. We believe in open exchange of ideas, accelerate scientific progress towards solving our most persistent problems. The challenges of disease, poverty, education, social justice, and environment are too urgent to waste time on studies, lacking rigor outcomes that never are never shared and are results that are not reproducible. So the whole idea of the project is to be open um, so everything should be open, but then you ask, you know, how do you, how do you provide security for something that's open? And when I interviewed for the, for the neon job, um, I was sitting in that interview and, and the hiring manager said, you know, we, we share our data, we give it away and, you know, can you secure it? And as a security guy, I was like, I'm in and, you know, this is, this is going to be easy. But then we'll get into, you know, what is cybersecurity? And of course, uh, this is the Cisco definition of cybersecurity, the practice of protecting systems and networks and programs from digital attacks. And then I, I did highlight these on purpose. The, uh, these cyber attacks are usually aimed at accessing and changing or destroying sensitive information. Um, in science, that accessing and changing is the most important for us. Um, and then, uh, of course, implementing effective cybersecurity measures is uh, particularly challenging today because there are more devices than there are people and attackers are becoming more innovative. Um, so 
The other part of security that I'm assuming everybody might have heard of this, um, the security triad. So you've got uh, confidentiality, integrity, or availability, um, the CIA triangle. Um, so for us, for science, uh, integrity is our most important aspect. Uh, it's essential because confidentiality, I mean, we're giving away our data. And then, of course, uh, so it would, it, for us, it would be integrity, availability, then confidentiality. And uh, because we need to make sure that nobody changes that data um, and also that that data is available, of course. Um, so basically for a security guy, we're looking for a framework, you know, to work off of. Um, this is an example of one. This is uh, pretty popular. This is the NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, so basically you would use this as a framework, as a template, you know, identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. Um, and you would build your whole security program around this to cover each one of the uh, subcategories there. Um, so, so going back to what I was talking about with science and security, uh, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, they go against each other, right? Because it's, Hey, we need to share everything, but I'm trying to secure everything. And so uh, I, I wanted to throw this in here because, you know, what does a, how, what does a typical security guy think, you know, when, when somebody comes up and says, Hey, secure this, um, my, or at least this is what I think. Uh, my very first thought is identify the data. Um, you know, what is the classification of that data? And um, so the first question would be what access is needed? ACLs, which uh, that's not a uh, ACL like in your knee. Um, that's an access control list. And an access control list provides permissions to an object. So who needs access to that object? Uh, where is the data located? Is it in the core of the network or is it out in the DMZ? Uh, the DMZ is the demilitarized zone that's outside your firewall, but inside your outside router, which goes to your upspring, upstream provider. Um, that's usually where your web servers and things of that nature sit there. And then, uh, and then what kind of data? Because the typical cybersecurity guy in the world deals with the, the three big ones are PHI, PCI, and PII, which is private health information, um, you know, healthcare information that's identifiable to a person or health information. And then uh, PCI payment card or plastic card, I believe is what that was originally supposed to be. Um, that would be credit card numbers and such. And then PII, uh, private identifiable information like your social security number, that kind of thing. Um, those are the three main that pretty much the, the, the world of security focuses on those. But then you've also got CUI, which is confidential unclassified information. And then you've got confidential and then you've got classified, which would be the secret top secret and uh, above top secret. That would be probably mostly uh, a national security military troop movements, weapon systems, that kind of thing. Um, but you'll notice that there's, there's really nothing for science in here. Um, the, the CUI, which I'll go, I'll skip to the next, uh, compliance regulations match up with these. For example, HIPAA and PHI go hand in hand. Uh, you've got FISMA, which is federal. You got DOD 8570. These are all compliance regulations or laws that we have to abide by if you've got that cut, like for HIPAA, you have to abide by HIPAA law if you've got PHI, uh, private health information. But for science, there really isn't anything defined um, because we're not really, most of the time, I won't say all the time, but most of the time, we're not dealing with confidential information. Uh, but we need that integrity. So CUI kind of seeped in to the world of science through uh, right below there, 800-171. That's a uh, NIST standard. And so you have a compliance regulation and like, let's just say 800-171. And under that regulation, you'll have 
a bunch of controls, you know, that say you must encrypt the data, like HIPAA, for example, HIPAA data, any PHI must be encrypted in transit and at the end of it. So you've got to encrypt the file and then send it through an encrypted tunnel. That's the law. But in science, we don't have that. And so when I go back to my interview and I said, yeah, this will be easy because you're giving away the data. It's actually a lot harder because if I was working in a HIPAA world, um, you know, it's the law. So nobody can argue with you. But uh, and of course, security guys tend to be the guys that everybody dreads seeing because either we're going to come to you and say, you did something wrong or we're going to try to make you change something. And, and everybody, I mean, nobody likes change. Right. So, so for us, the not having some kind of fallback, like a law or a regulation, it makes things a debate. So um, typically if we're, it, it makes a lot, there's a lot more discussion about the risk versus reward. Um, cause you can, you could go to a scientist and say, uh, I'm gonna, I need you to do this encryption or something. And they might say, you know, that's going to slow down our system 10%. And we don't think it's worth it because we're giving away the data anyway. Uh, <laughs> so, so it makes the job a lot harder because you don't have that law or that compliance regulation to fall back on. And it was very interesting to me when I came into this sector that it was like that. I was, I was shocked for the most part. Um, and then of course we do risk assessments, um, which is who is the threat? Uh, what are the threat actors trying to accomplish and what is the impact of business? Now in science, this is different too, because the most of the world goes off of confidentiality. And so the threat would be somebody stealing the data and getting it like a credit card number. Um, for us, the threats are different. Um, let's say that you had a science project that might discover something like a new product, you know, a, a new gidget, widget for something. Um, you've got, you know, uh, corporate espionage, like somebody wants it, um, or it could be a nation state wants to break in and steal your research. Or it could just be um, somebody doesn't agree with what you're doing, and so they want to make you look foolish, so they want to alter your research. Um, so they might want to get in and, you know, change your data, so then when you go public with that data or whatever, they can say, well, it's, it's all, you know, it's, it's been changed. I know it's been changed because I changed it. And so it invalidates the, you know, the... Uh, uh, I don't know what word I'm looking for here. It invalidates the integrity of the data. And um, so it's, so even in that sense, in risks, we're looking at different risks than most other security techs. Um, and then what's the, I mean, it could, you think about the impact to the business. If somebody invalidates all your data, um, I mean, you're, you're done, right? It, uh, it's, a, it's a big deal. So this is what keeps us up at night. Um, so, uh, so I, I, I titled this slide, it's kind of interesting, open science versus cybersecurity. Um, because the science community inherently wants to be open and they want everybody to share data because science doesn't work without that. Right. And, or it does work without that, but a lot slower. And, uh, so the more that science can share with each other, the faster and better things are. And uh, so I was thinking up some questions here. Um, how do you secure data that's supposed to be openly accessible? Um, it's uh, my rule has always been since I've been a security guy. Um, it, security is my number one priority until I stop someone from doing their job. Uh, if I stop someone from doing their job, then I need to rethink what I'm doing um, because it needs to be a priority, but it can't interfere and science is on the farthest edge of that spectrum, right? Because everything's supposed to be open. Um, and so it, it makes the job a lot harder. And then I asked this question, are, are security tools designed to work with science? 
um, because almost all security tools are for confidentiality. Uh, I mean, some stuff like encryption and stuff provides integrity and everything, but, um, you know, like firewalls and, uh, I mean, they do provide integrity to some extent, but nothing is designed specifically for it. And so you got to ask yourself, we can't just go in and throw in every security tool that everybody else is doing because we're kind of looking at it in a different point of view. Um, we do want the security and the, and the confidentiality, but it's, it's a different thing. I guess it's a different mindset. And then uh, can academics be secured? Um, because probably the whole science community is tied to universities and, and colleges. And as, as anybody who's been in security for a while, uh, university and colleges are inherently insecure. Um, I mean, it's kind of a product of the environment because you've got a whole bunch of people um, coming on and of course you've got college kids who think they're hackers or whatever. So you're just constantly dealing at dealing with this insecure situation. So how do you, cause we're tied to them. Uh, everybody's tied to them for the most part in the science world. So is it even possible to secure when you're trying to share information with uh, academics? Um, are there uh, any current frameworks designed for science? Um, no, none that are designed specifically around science. Um, there's some that we see that bleed in all the time, like 800-53 and 800-59. Those, those come into science quite a bit. And the, the one I was referring to earlier, 800-171. But there's really, those are all designed over around confidentiality. Um, they're not designed around integrity. Once again, they provide integrity, but they're, they're not designed around it. Um, are there any current compliance methodologies designed for science? And as I was just saying, no, there's um, not specifically for science. So, so I started asking myself uh, when I started this job, how can cybersecurity help science? Um, and I had the conversation with our, um, with a couple of our scientists and I said, are you guys interested in chain of custody of your data? And they, they gave me that look of curiosity and they were like, you know, what are you, what are you talking about? And I was like, well, if somebody wanted to argue your research or argue your results, let's say sensor data, I can make sure that they can't argue it. Um, I can make sure that data is encrypted. I can have ACLs or access control lists that are logged so we can show every time that data has been accessed and whether it's been manipulated or not. And they were like, this is great. You know, let's do it. And, uh, and then data routing and system performance. I mean, um, like in our world with those sensors that I was showing you on that tower, those all run Ethernet. And so they're, they're doing power over ethernet. So the science world jumped into the technology world and said, you know, hey, we can run data across the same wire we can get power from. This is perfect, you know, for a sensor. And so being able to route that data and then uh, we can also improve system performance um, quite a bit. The uh, access controls of uh, ACLs again, uh, those are work really good for streamlining roles. Um, if one person's, uh, you know, to keep them from doing something, they're not on a security perspective, but to keep somebody from accidentally like entering data in the wrong place or um, entering data they're not supposed to for whatever reason, um, we can streamline those roles with access controls so they won't even be able to do it. And then of course, network segmentation um, to prevent data mixing. Um, where I was really going with that one is uh, cross-site scripting. And uh, a lot of times uh, people like to shoot data from development over into production and vice versa, um, if they have any kind of issues or anything. So if we do network segmentation, it prevents them from doing that. Um, do we have any questions or anything? Yeah, there's a couple in the chat box. Um, okay. One, them, one is, uh, can you describe the process, or more, more specifically a typical timeline, for such a collaboration 
the, for example, how and when the infrastructure design and implementation takes place to support open science. I think I read that. Uh, right. If uh, so, I haven't been at Neon since the beginning, um, but the construction phase I believe lasted about five years. To, or, uh, I think it was a little longer than that. I think it was almost six years. Um, to build all those towers, uh, get the network up and running, get the data center servers. Um, as you can imagine, uh, we've got petabytes of data um, and it, it takes quite a bit. I hope that answered the question, right? We'll, we'll check, uh, but while we're waiting, the other question is, how often does this research data manipulation occur? Do we have any statistics available? Uh, no, not that I know of. Um, uh, we've never, I, I don't think we've ever experienced it. Um, I don't, I can't think of any examples of where anybody's experienced it, but um, I guess if, if the manipulation was really good, we wouldn't know about it. Um, but. Uh, but it's, uh, I mean, it's to safeguard that. And, and I think most organizations are, are, you know, encrypting data and to prevent it. Um, yeah, I can't think of any big major, uh, I know when, the, when the, the two guys over in, I think it was in France or Belgium, they shot the particle, or they shot the particle from Belgium to France. Um, their data wasn't manipulated, I don't think, but it was wrong. Um, and I, but there was a question. I remember when that story came out, um, and I might be wrong. I, I, I remember there was a question about whether the data had been manipulated. Um, that was a big deal. If if people don't know what I'm talking about, that was uh, they thought that they had proved Einstein wrong. Um, they shot a particle, and and then after about I think it was about six months, um, a bunch of other scientists looked at their data and said, your numbers are wrong. And so Einstein was right again. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, there's one, another one. Uh, one of our previous speakers mentioned federated identities being used to share data. Example, Edugain. Um, I'm assuming this aligns with ACL. Could you comment on that? Yes, yes. So uh, doing federated or single sign-on, um, that's, that, that's actually a good question because that brings up something that's interesting to me. Um, we are working on a project and the, the question that came up was, we've got a bunch of college kids that need, I, I call them kids because I'm older, but we got a bunch of college folks that need access to the data and they said they want to log in with Facebook uh, you know, let's make it easy for them. Let's, let's let them use single sign on from Facebook, Twitter, uh, any of the social media. And for a security guy, I just cringe. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, no, no, let's not. Um, because we all know of the problems with security with Facebook and everything. Um, that would be uh, single sign on using, uh, using one set of credentials and carrying the token from which place to the other. Um, an ACL isn't the same thing. I mean, an ACL is a, it's a control list to sh control the permissions on an object, um, but it leads to the same thing. So you log on and then your, your login is, uh, I guess, given ACLs would be a way to put it. Um, so you're al allowed access to the data. But it is interesting because we do work with a lot of college kids and so they want the, you know, don't make me sign in 12 times. And so can I use my Facebook, which everybody's using, but when you're, when you're looking at, um, because there are, I don't, I don't want to misrepresent this. So like, I, I know that there's multiple different science projects that are working with like the U S Navy. Um, and so that brings in a whole nother uh, issue because of course, if you're transferring data across the Navy's network, that's all secured. So then in the security world, now I have to adopt their compliance. So, you know, the Navy might say, you've got to be doing 800-59. Uh, um, and so then we've got to meet all those controls 
for our data. And um, and so in the what I would getting back to the single sign on or the the uh, shared tokens, it's if I give those college kids access through their Facebook uh, login um, and Facebook is compromised, that's probably it. Well, I know it wouldn't work with, with the Navy. There's no way they'd allow it, but, um, but trying to keep things easy um, because science can become a roadblock. You know, it, uh, if you got to do, uh, if you guys have done two factor authentication and, and things like that, it gets so cumbersome that people won't use it. And if people don't use it, then we're out of business. Um, any more questions? Uh, yeah. So I want to clarify my question about infrastructure. So okay. uh, most of the open science projects, uh, this is Jay, by the way, uh, most, most of the open science project, I would assume that there are a lot of uh, scientific instrumentation that's being built or a lot of requirement that's beyond security, enterprise security kind of control. So security design on top of that uh, to support it may, may be easy, may be difficult. And I was just thinking about that timeline, right? So let, let you just show us a picture in Alaska, there's some instrumentation over there. The, 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 the security infrastructure to, to support that, uh, surrounding it, um, is it easy, is it difficult? Is it like a one month, one week kind of project? Is it like six month, two years project to design implement it? I want to get a sense of the timeline and how it takes to really support a, a, a open science instrumentation project kind of like that. Uh, okay, gotcha. So it's, uh, it's, it, it's ongoing all the time. And uh, um, one of the things that we run into a lot, I think in the, in the science community is um, let's just say you have a science appliance, a, a spectrometer or, or something of that nature. Um, sometimes those things are running like Windows 7 or Windows 10 and, and they might be located at a tower like ours. And so it's like, how do you update those? How do you get security patches out to those? And, and so it's, it's this constant ongoing project. I mean, um, and then you've got physical security with all this, all this stuff. Um, I know that the original, I showed you guys that picture of that tower. The original towers that we had actually had metal. Um, they had like a metal. I don't. I don't know what, how to describe it. It was like a. It was like a frame that bent out like a like a fence around like a prison, so people couldn't get on the tower, and but that didn't work because we needed those booms and everything out there. So it's it's not only it, we need physical security too, which I have to deal with to some extent. Um, and so it's just this constant, I would say the, the, the security design around everything. I mean, it's built in from day one. I mean, it was, everybody's got security on, on their mind, but um, the, the different challenges pop up. Um, I know that we, I think the, the biggest physical security issue we ever had was, uh, I think we had some hunters climb a tower. Um, they didn't, they didn't do anything to it. They didn't, but they were using it so they could see further. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's, how do you, how do you uh, secure all this stuff? It, and, and the reason I brought up the, the machine might be running windows or something. Um, it's kind of the, what I see is a lack of technical knowledge in the science world. I mean, if I was going to build a machine that needed to run, you know, years, without being rebooted, it wouldn't be on Windows. Um, but we see that. Um, so it's so then you got to deal with that as how do you keep that up and running? How do you uh, patch it? You know, and of course we all know that, you know, there's never any Windows updates, right? And uh, so trying to get that patch out to these remote sites and stuff, it's a challenge. And but it's an ongoing thing. Um, and it, and we try to improve it all the time. Um, so you're you're, it's kind of like chasing your tail, you know, because by the time you get everything updated, it's re, it's time to update it again. And so you're just constantly going through this circle, um, patching stuff. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. And there's another one in the chat box. Um, okay. How do you, ready? <laughs> 
That was yep. really good to hear, Tim. Um, <laughs> how do you go about mitigating the impacts of corrupted data in open science projects when so many people have been using that corrupted data, assuming it takes some time for the security team to realize that the data, that there's a data integrity issue? Um, that's an interesting question. We, we actually experienced this. It wasn't, wasn't necessarily, uh, I don't know, you could call it corrupted data. It wasn't a security issue. It was, uh, I believe it was a, a bad algorithm. Um, something was being computed wrong. And what we had to do was basically shut down the data portal and go back and correct it. Um, I, I don't know the specifics because I'll, I'll be the first one to admit um, being a security guy, all that stuff they're doing in science, <laughs> I try to stay out of it. But uh, I, we haven't had any, and I, I don't know any off the top of my head of of an actual security issue where somebody went in and and altered data, which is a good thing. That means the security guys are doing their jobs. But uh, but we did have an instance where it was a, I, I believe it was an algorithm was wrong. And so we basically had to announce that to everyone um, that the data that they had gotten was incorrect and then correct it. And so we had to shut down the portal for a while. They had to work out the calculations and then turn it back on. Thanks. Um, so do you, so yeah, as far as like data integrity when it's not, when it's due to something like the algorithm or sometimes, you know, just hardware, you can have bit flips here and there. Um, so does that come into your realm to watch out for that stuff too, or is it mostly like bad actor type security? Uh, no, I, well, so it, de it depends on how it happens. If there's any kind of an issue, I'm like, let's say data was corrupted or something. I would be included in it. Um, I get included in every meeting, every conference call, everything. Um, and, but in the, like in this case, it, it turned out to be an issue with the algorithm. So um, they they took that and ran with it. I yeah, I wasn't. Uh, if it was a security issue, we would have to react. In the, and that gets back to that framework. Um, you know, uh, how are we going to recover from this? And uh, I'm trying to, uh, I got a pop up here on my screen. Um, so uh, back to the question, we, as a security guy, you've constantly got to be looking because of course, when it first happens, in this case, we actually caught the algorithm. Um, but if someone were to come back and say, hey, your data's all changed, um, I would have to respond immediately to that. And then I would basically do forensics, um, you know, look at the access logs, um, and I would have to work hand in hand with the, the science team. Thanks. It looks like we ran out of questions for now. Okay, I, I still do have some slides, um, but uh, that was fun. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, my last slide, actually, I think it is. Um, how do we improve this relationship uh, between cybersecurity and science? Um, we build a science security framework, which the trusted CI is actually doing now. Um, we've been working on that for a while. Um, hopefully that will become the, the standard for all the NSF major facilities. That would be nice. Um, and then we educate the science community on the benefits. Cause I, I think, um, I don't think security, techs are real good at that of uh, like I went to our science team and said this is how I can help you um, you know uh, so I think we need to do a better job of that and then uh, develop compliance regulation around science I know that NIST is working right now they're trying to come up with a compliance regulation slash framework that works for everything that works for healthcare and uh, you know, DOD and all that. Um, whether or not that's possible, I don't know. It would be nice because then we wouldn't all have to worry about, um, like I was, when I was talking about the different compliance levels, um, you might get on a project that 
has 859, 853, DOD 8570. You've got four or five different, um, Craig and I were talking about that with the Trusted CI framework. It's gotta be flexible enough that it can work with any of the different compliance levels. Um, so you might end up having to satisfy a whole bunch of different regulations or laws. Um, and then I think uh, security could do a lot better job of understanding science and the goals. Um, you know, like the open science, I mean, just knowing what open science is would be a big step for most. Um, and understand that what I said, security is my number one priority until I stop someone from doing their job. And uh, then we got to rethink what we're doing. And then just working together in communication. Um, because I think there's a lot more that, uh, especially around, and I won't get into it because we'll head down a rabbit hole, but um, uh, blockchaining um, will be a huge thing for science. So, and I think that's it. There's, there's a question, but first I just want to say how much I love that slide. You just captured <laughs> all the things right there in one spot. Um, yeah. So we do have another question. Uh, have you assessed the risk for the NEON project in comparison to other types of academic or non-academic cyber risks? In other words, what are your thoughts on the risk versus investment in this domain versus other domains? Um, so yes, I have. I have done uh, risk assessment. Um, will I talk about it here? No, um, because uh, if <laughs> we want this to uh, be public, and uh, I don't want to give anybody any ideas, but um, it's interesting. You can have different um, risks, stuff that you would never dream of, um, like politics, um, uh, things of that nature. Um, you have to take into account in a risk assessment. And if 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 I'm explaining this right without explaining it, um, <laughs> it. Uh, so yes, we have done a risk assessment and- um, Perhaps I can help at, to ask at a higher level. Okay. Uh, so do you see the risk here is more monetary uh, versus other types? Or is this more frequent? Uh, I'm thinking about, well, th like thinking about dimensions, right? There's a frequency of attacks. There's uh, uh, the monetary loss uh, for this. This is a, uh, intangible uh, impact. Uh, so think about those high levels, neon project versus other types of academic nineteen projects, the cyber risk for them, uh, how, how are they differ? I mean, in general sense, right? Not necessarily for neon, but for this kind of open science project, how, how do they differ in the yeah. sense? Of, yeah. yeah, I get what you're saying. Um, it's, it's a lot easier. I, I would say that um, because we're, we don't see the I guess we don't see the frequency of attacks as, say, a credit card company. Um, they they would they would have a lot more attacks than uh, than we would. But uh, it what we do have is the uh, we do have to uh, worry. About, I, I guess I don't know. It would be. I mean, the risk would probably be more. Um, Directed, I guess, would be a, a good way to put it. Um, so, uh, you know, we we have to uh, we have to deal with uh, and, and I'm trying to explain this without uh, divulging anything. So, we would have to uh, make sure that not not only the entire um, let's say uh, the entire world is trying to attack us, but it seems like it's, it would be more of a specific group, if that makes sense. Um, like somebody who didn't like your data or didn't want your project to be successful or um, not, I mean, like a credit card company, they get attacked by anybody who wants credit cards. Um, for us, it would be a smaller group of people and and so so actually the security is a lot easier in that sense plus like i said we give away our data i always joke about this it's probably not true but if if somebody were to get in and like steal the data i'd say well we're giving it away tomorrow anyway um 
but uh, that's never happened, by the way. But if it were to happen, I guess you could say that. But Okay. Thank you. Yep. Awesome. Let's see. Ready for more? Sure. Why not? Uh, what do you foresee as the biggest concern for CIA in the future? Not sure if you can do this, but could you comment on attacks, attackers, etc.? Um, one of the one of the big things that the FBI recently is uh, oh also in the in the day in the life of a security guy, I spend about an hour hour and a half a morning reading all the latest security information. You know who got hacked or whatever. And by the way, I hate the word hacked because um, everybody uses it wrong. But uh, <laughs> But uh, 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 we talk to law enforcement quite a bit. And um, I mean, the FBI's really been pushing um, spying from nation states in the science world, um, uh, coming in to steal research, steal you know, information. And um, so that, that's added like a whole nother level of, you know, uh, now you're talking about working with, you know, HR, or, you know, how do you, uh, I mean, you're looking for spies. That's crazy. Um, I, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, that's great. And then uh, one, one more. Um, are there scientists or domain experts with the, with the scientific background within the security group? Is, is something that would be improved in the understanding of risk controls or mitigations? Um, or is it enough to have constant communication with the scientists? So I think, yeah, so are, do you have any of the scientists in the security group? Um, no, not necessarily. Um, that's a, that brings up a great comment, though, that I could make. Um, when I first took this job, uh, a lot of the comments from the people that had worked there before me, they said, you know, one of the problems we have is we have these scientists guys, and they're really smart. And you try to implement something and they figure out a way to get around it, you know, because they're really smart. And so, uh, so I haven't, I haven't experienced that a lot. And, but what I have experienced with them is um, when I go in and I say, Hey, we're going to, you know, firewall this or encrypt this or whatever, they want to know how it works, you know? And so then you get the propeller spinning, you know, and we go back and forth. And, and uh, so it's actually a pleasure. Um, I don't, I don't know of anybody who's actually a scientist that is involved in security. I have to talk to them all the time um, to uh, see what they're doing. Um, the science world, this is another point, I guess, um, the science community is set up different than like the private sector. Um, a lot of the scientific devices, which might be a Windows machine, it might be running Windows, they control and run those. I, the, usually the IT group doesn't, and and uh, and so that's a, they're in a different silo, and so we've got to help them constantly um, because they're really not qualified for it in a way. Um, you know, they so they come to us all the time for help, and we've got to work hand in hand a lot. And it's actually, I, I would say it's different than the private sector because everybody's a lot more friendly in the science community. They really are. I mean, in the in the private sector, everybody talks about don't work in a silo because usually when somebody works in a silo, they don't talk to anybody else. And in the science world, it's not that way. Um, a lot of communication going on. That's great. Um, I'm glad to hear that. That's what I was curious about is like, since you have the, the industry experience, you know, how is it different um, from working in the academic community? So it's nice to hear your stories. It, it, when I, when I first got in and I noticed that we have scientists running windows machines or whatever, I was like, what, what, is, that's a disaster. And I still would say, I'm not exactly happy about it, but I think it, and I don't know if it was done this way on purpose, but it forces us to work with each other and uh, which is a good thing. Yeah, but I still don't, you know, yeah. I still don't think they should be running servers or anything. <laughs> right. It doesn't help that there's applications that have only ever been built for Windows. Um, yeah, well, the, the reason I'm picking on Windows is um, because most science appliances, they're going, don't ever reboot it, don't ever touch it, we want it to run for 30 years. And I'm like, Windows isn't designed for that. 
that that's not how it works. So nope, there's still that one Windows 98 machine back there running some piece of equipment. Yeah, well, and that and that's the other thing. If you've got an appliance or a, it's an instrument that's running it, you're, you're telling them, hey, sorry to ruin the party, but you got to take that thing offline to upgrade it and or upgrade the hardware. So. How do you deal with that sort of discussion? Like, I imagine, you know, if that's the only way they can run an instrument, that it's going to cause, it's going to be hard to find a good solution that makes everybody happy. Um, actually, I was, I've been dealing with this for quite a while. It, it's, they have to understand the benefits of what you're doing, um, because it is true. Um, if we update everything and keep it patched up, it'll run better. Um, it'll run more efficiently, but um, you've got to build that into your program. Um, they don't necessarily like it, but, um, you know, build in a maintenance window or something of that nature. But uh, it's, yeah, it's tough. It's tough because you're blending technology as in IT into the science world. And they're like, well, I want that sensor to run forever and don't ever want it down. And, and you're going, well, we got to reboot it. We've got to patch it and all that. And so uh, I think eventually the science world will, will catch up. And because you're starting to, I think, I, I don't know if I'm correct with this, but my opinion is I, you're starting to see information technology just bleeding into science. Oh, and absolutely. so, and so they're kind of behind, you know, that was like putting windows on a device. You want to stay up for months or years. That was like us 10 years ago. Um, and now we've learned to use Linux, Unix, uh, other more stable back office platforms. Yeah. All right. We're inching up on the top of the hour, but I see another question. Um, so this is from fellow. I'm an educator. Any tips, words of wisdoms for students in both computer science and social science disciplines also, and also for researchers because, because I'm that too. Um, as in security tips or career advice, <laughs> yes, security tips, both. Or both. Both. I was going to say, I was going to say, I'm not the guy to ask for advice to look what I'm doing. Um, so, uh, security tips, um, the number one threat vector right now. And it, as a security guy, you kind of, everybody kind of looks at you weird, but it's email. Um, I mean, everything that's occurred, um, is email. So, phishing and scam emails and spam and all that. Um, the credential harvesting is what they're trying to do. So it's kind of, it's kind of strange because you can say, well, we got these big firewalls and intrusion detection and all this, you know, big time stuff. But what I'm really worried about is don't click on that and, and making sure you can't click on it. So, uh, so I would say uh, be careful around uh, just the simple stuff. And then don't ever, this is one thing that everybody needs to understand. There's always that six degrees of separation thing. Um, like for example, we, we give away our data. You know, we're, we're an ecological company. Who would care about us? But if in the past what we've seen with like some of the, some of the nation state hacks, they might get to somebody's brother-in-law to get to the brother who works at a power plant who, and don't ever underestimate that. Don't ever think, well, they wouldn't come after me because I don't have anything because they might not be targeting you. And that's usually what they do. If they can get your credentials, then they get your address book and then they climb up the, the chain. So, so I guess that would be the biggest tip. Be careful with, with email and spam. It is the number one threat vector. And then um, do all the security you can um, everything is possible. A lot of it's a lot easier than you think it is. And, um, and then I have a theory that I want to spread around the world. If we all give companies bogus information, then if they sell our information, it's useless. Um, <laughs> so. Oh yeah, no, that's great. That's what I put. Like, I just use a password manager that generates the answers to like, what's your mother's maiden name? I just put a whole big long string. Of well, I like, like websites ask you your birth date and all that stuff. And you, and you know, they're selling all that information. So I was like, if we can get everybody to lie on their birth date, then nobody will buy that data because it won't be accurate. Yeah. That's a big task I'm taking on there, but, um, I shall from now on lie to everyone. 
(laughs) (laughs) That's my advice. Lie to everybody. (laughs) Uh, We have one more, and we should probably call this our last one. Uh, How about researchers who want to set up a data repository for people to download? Is that something that keeps you up at night? Yeah, I would say the the number one threat, back to the other question, that I worry about in science is probably ransomware. Um, because because data is our business, you know, and so if if ransomware were to get in, I mean, it's a mess, you know, ransomware, you either, you got three choices, you can either restore your data from backup, pay them or lose your data. And, um, and as you've seen in the news, with they're hitting all the the local governments and things like that that's that's usually what keeps me up at night um so if you're going to set up a data repository make sure you've got every countermeasure you know for uh, ransomware thank you well and with that i think i just want to thank you so much tim this has been a terrific session and thanks to the fellows for as always being so engaged um and i think that will be it for for this week yeah, and thank you for having me. It was if, fun. If you're getting lots of thank yous in the chat box. <laughs> Let's take a look. Um, thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you. And thanks, Diana, for, for your recording magic. No problem. Enjoy, everyone. Thank thanks. you. See you all next week. <laughs>